Have you been doing okay? Any uh, respiratory issues? I'm doing, I mean, very well on the cough assistance. Whatever it's called. Yeah, the cough assist. I was looking through the records and it looks as though you have been using nighttime ventilation since about January 2009. Yeah, that's correct. And you started the mouthpiece around May of 2009. Okay. Oh, I just looked it up. So that means you've actually been using the mouthpiece for about five years. That makes sense. I was diagnosed. Did you find it difficult to get onto the mouthpiece initially? Did it uh, was it challenging? No, the mouthpiece was very easy. The the nighttime in the beginning was hard. With the mask. With the mask. First of all, I had to find a suitable mask. And the other one, he, he, when I had good breathing, he, I was fighting the mask. And that caused problems, but as my breathing went down, actually it got much easier. Yeah, I remember those first few uh, months were quite challenging. That right, so... so. Do you find that the mouthpiece helps you, besides giving you the breath that you need, do you find it helps you with things like swallowing, blowing your nose? Yeah. That's interesting. Blowing the nose, no. Whenever I have mucus, I put on the other mask, and that has absolutely clears my nose. But swallowing, let's put it this way, it doesn't interfere. Okay. And that's a big achievement. If you stop using the mouthpiece though, do you think you could breathe on your own for a few minutes? For, no, not breathing. But after 30 seconds I lose conscience. <laughs> okay, we let's not practice that here. <laughs> so you, right. you really are fully uh, dependent on the ventilator. Yes, yes. Does it trouble you that it's not attached? Are you worried about the fact that you have to use the mouthpiece, that it's not as secure, for example, as a tracheostomy? And no, no, I feel much better. It gives me freedom to talk. By the way, I don't, I, I, even though I have a pig, I eat and drink only from my mouth. I can talk, I can turn on my head, so I'm very, very happy with it. And have you noticed since I saw you last any change in your voice or your swallowing abilities? I no, I don't notice it. First of all, it's so gradual mm -hmm. that if there is a change, you will notice it before me because it's very, very gradual. But okay. You and I have discussed the fact that there will ultimately be a limit to the ability of non-invasive ventilation to sustain your breathing and that the choice of a tracheostomy may face you at some point. And even though it's been a long time, almost five years, that uh, alternative still remains how do you feel about uh, approaching a tracheostomy, that decision? I feel actually very confident. You see, before, I, if they would tell me that I would have a peg in my stomach, I would get very scared. I have it already for five years. And it almost doesn't bother me. Before, if you tell me that I would have to be on assisted breathing, I would be very scared. And now, it's very good. I, it doesn't bother me much. 
So I would take this hacker to be the same way. <laughs> Try it out, see what we can do with it. And then we'll I mean we'll make the decision later. Do you think if you need a, a tracheostomy that you'd be able to stay at home? I don't know. Maybe yes, I am part. Maybe yes. I mean, it all depends. We'll see. I'll tell you something. I've been already for five, six years. The first two years I was very worried. What's going to be and what's this and what that. And I had more anxiety from the anxiety than from the real sickness. So now I don't have anxiety from the anxiety. And I just take the sickness as it comes and so far it has been a very good five years. And I don't see a reason why with the help of such good doctors we cannot cope. Further with the tracheostomy or other stuff. Whatever comes our way, we'll overcome it. Okay. Would it influence your decision whether you were able to stay at home or have to go into uh, long term care? I, will, I don't know. Right now, I don't know how long term care is. Some people are telling me all stories, some people are saying it's good, so I'll try it out, we'll see how it works. I guess there's not many people in my condition that probably have zero self-breathing capacities, but they can do it like this. So, I mean, I'm very lucky. I'm glad you bring that up because, in fact, you do have very, very little, almost unmeasurable lung capacity on your own, and yet you're able to build your capacity up considerably. Uh, you increase your capacity by 800% when you breath stack. It's still not a huge volume, it's only a liter, but it's all that you need to sustain yourself. Yeah. So actually I do the exercises uh, every day. The, the breath stacking? Yes. Lung volume recruitment? Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you very much uh, sharing this because you know that this treatment is uncommon and I think it's important that folks with ALS who need to use ventilation for more than just at night don't necessarily have to have a tracheostomy. It would be a shame for you to have had a tracheostomy for the last four or five years when you didn't really need it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you and I'm very happy that I took this route. And so far it's been very great for me. I noted in the chart that you had a problem with your resuscitation bag recently. And you had to replace it? I lost it. <laughs> you lost it. So it's critical that you have a resuscitation bag at, at every time, every moment, in case there's a mechanical yeah, failure. Yeah, I do that. Whenever I go out, I go. Okay. I take it. And, yeah. Well, we thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your efforts. For your efforts. Visit our website at www.canventottawa.ca for additional comprehensive information.